All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a, another coffee chat. Uh, this morning's coffee chat, I'm being joined uh, by my friend Chris Coleman in uh, Minnesota. Good morning, Chris. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. So Chris Coleman uh, is a, uh, a tour guide. Uh, Chris has been a guide in France for, gosh, uh, more than 20 years, and she is an expert on all things uh, French, but she also is into wine and yoga and all kinds of things that I enjoy. So I thought today, Chris and I would have our coffee, our coffee chat today. Uh, and actually, it's morning for you, right? Still, so you are also having a coffee chat, right? Well, you know, it's it's always noon somewhere. So at some point, I'm going to have to be turning to to the wine. And I, I actually, I, I'm going to show you a little something in a minute. But um, I, I grabbed an Italian bottle just in your honor. But oh, thank you. Um, so Chris has been doing uh, tours all over uh, Europe and France in particular. And now she's become a wine rep and she also has her own yoga studio uh, called Yoga Forest and you do online yoga classes as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So with this awesome pandemic, you know, um, everything changed as we know, um, basically lost all my streams of income. Um, travel, as we know, is dead right now and the yoga studio had to physically close. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm in a good place. I mean, I, as far as how I feel about it, I mean, it was at the time a difficult thing to do, losing my community, um, my yoga community physically. Um, but I have to say, I really enjoy teaching online. I've really, I've really enjoyed doing that. And so that I shifted to that pretty quickly, um, just grabbed a program called Namastream. There's, there's quite a few platforms out there nowadays, but um, grab this platform that it really looks beautiful. It, it's really super slick. Like I can do a, a live class, you know, record it and then post it so that people, if they can't make it, you know, they can see it later, just a lot like, you know, Zoom calls and such. And um, so I probably have close to, well, I don't know if I have a hundred yet, but close to a hundred classes under my belt recorded. Wow. Um, and that was, you know, the whole learning curve of like lighting and microphones and, you know, just the technology piece. And I think what, what, you know, tripped me up most was the, like, what they call them dongles. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, Which that'll never not be funny. <laughs> it just sounds like a body part, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> not a pretty one, not a pretty one. Um, <laughs> anyway, so those, those things would be like, well, why isn't this connect with that and why did apple change their you know connector again and you know whatever anyway so that that was the hardest i think the technology was fine it was the dongles that tripped me up but anyway um so that's been a, it's an interesting learning process for all of us using uh, sorry but that's a, that's a golden sentence uh, the dongles trip me up <laughs> <laughs> that could be a cartoon right can you see that is like a, just a, a simple cartoon yeah <laughs> Sorry, you guys have turned into eighth grade girls, but you know, <laughs> it's okay. I live with an eighth grader, so this is my my humor. <laughs> so I've I've actually just started um, recently with my own yoga, yoga studio doing the online yoga, and it's weird because I the reason I love doing yoga with other people is just the community, the sense of community that you have. I was surprised actually how good it was having a small group though, because I think the one that I've the ones I've done have had no more than seven or eight people in them, but it still feels personal, even though you're not with them. So are you doing it in a Zoom setting where you can see everybody like Hollywood Squares or Muppet Show or whatever? Like Muppet yeah. Show, yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because my platform, and I, I can set it up that way, it's essentially Zoom that's fed in in the background for the this platform of Namastream. And um, so I choose to do broadcasting so that they just, all that's on the screen is me but okay. then there's a, a chat function on the side and then I can see who's there. You know, I can click and see, you know, Bobby and Susie and Johnny are all there. And, and I can kind of feel like, do you remember, um, was it Zoom or Romper Room that you could, this woman had like this, it was like a mirror and it would like swirl with colors and she'd say, I see Susie and Bobby and Johnny. Yes, I do. Oh, that's so creepy. That is like a weird, that's a weird part of my childhood. Yeah. That was that romper room. It must've been romper room. I think it was romper room. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember that spiral of colors, like, you know, psychedelic. Woo, woo. Gosh, that's, that is taking me back, man. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah, I was gonna say we're of a particular vintage. I'm not sure that many people would remember that that oh. 
<laughs> no. Anyway, so it, it seems to work. And I, I recently set a survey out to my, my um, students asking, do they pref would they prefer to actually see who else is in the space, you know? Um, Cause I felt like maybe they prefer to like see everybody and just feel like they're in a social experience, you know? Um, but most, it was like 80% said, no, leave it as it is. They, they liked the, the broadcast piece and maybe it's, it's more anonymous, like, you know, if you yeah. end up starting drinking wine while I'm teaching, it's, you know, no one can see what you're doing. <laughs> I actually did feel bad when I was doing yoga the other day because I had coffee and I was like, I would never do that in a yoga studio, but I'm in my living room. So of course I'm going to take a, take a break every now and then take a sip of my coffee. So, you know. yeah. Yeah. And, I, and also I had my son who's, uh, he's taking PE, remote PE, which is like, what a joke. So yeah, I know, totally. So to do remote PE, he was supposed to do a half an hour or an hour of remote, like his own thing. So he did yoga with me, but he didn't want to be seen. So he was off camera. Um, right, right. Like, so. Oh, that's so good. He's still at that moldable age a, a little, a little bit. My kids, when I first started the studio, I mean, I started it back in 2008 and, um, my kids were, they would come, they would come and they would do class with me. And especially my youngest, she was so serious about yoga. I mean, she was in her warrior too, like intense, you know, and I can't, I can't barely get them to do it now. I mean, it's, they're too cool or something. I don't know. I mean, but the funny thing is when they're injured or there's something going on physically for them, or they don't feel well, they'll, they'll ask me, they'll be like, mom, you know, what can I do about this? You know, whatever's going on. So they, they believe in it. They just, they play hockey. I mean, that's, they're into that right now. So as much as they can. They play hockey. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's the most Minnesota thing you could say, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's funny. I mean, well, here in Minnesota, it's just normal. You know what I mean? Um, a lot of girls play hockey, but um, I was just someone I, I talked to the other day. I was like surprised when I said, oh yeah, they both play hockey and yeah, it's good. It's good. Good for them. I mean, I'm still surprised that it's even going. I mean, the season hasn't even started, but they're doing, you know, preseason practicing and, you know, fingers crossed Minnesota's on the, on the rise as far as the, the numbers for the coronavirus. So we'll see. Let's oh see. yeah. Just the fact that they could do sports like that actually is kind of surprising, isn't it? It is. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know how long that'll last, but we'll see. But, but anyway, so the yoga stuff, you know, um, teaching classes online, and then I'm, I'm just completing by the end of this month, I'll be done with a yoga teacher training program. So I've just got a handful of ladies that I've been teaching to become yoga instructors. And um, the yoga alliance is this overseeing body that um, basically establishes you're not certified, but they register you. So there's always been a little bit of like, hmm, you know, how legit is this? But they 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 check up to see that you've followed a program of 200 hours and the program is registered with them. And um, anyway, they decided, oh, well, back in March, they were going to allow online hours to be contact hours. So like it, probably any kind of a teaching certification, um, you know, you need, you need to have so many hours in person with somebody, with a teacher, you know, and then your study time is, is counted separately, of course. But um, so they decided, okay, they were gonna allow any kind of virtual hours to be counted as hours. So when I found that out, I started my program. And so we've been meeting virtually for the most part, um, although we've had a few gatherings physically um, outside initially. And then I, a friend of mine um, runs a lot of programs at a, at a new, nearby church, which a huge, huge space. So there's just a few of us and we've got lots of space. So we've been really being safe with it. So um, the Yoga Alliance decided then to allow, basically, I think it's even through next year, even now they kept, they kept bumping out, you know, virtual hours will count as contact hours. Then, you know, first it was June then it was September and now it's through this year and maybe even into next year, I think too. So kind of, exciting for people who want to run a program that will be legitimized if you will by the yoga alliance um yeah, yeah. and that's that's been great for me and just for for a lot of people out there because so many studios have had to close you know or, or gyms and i mean 
It's, yeah, that's always been something that I have had on my wish list. If, if I ever had time, I'd love to do get certification as a yoga instructor, just because I think that would be such a great piece to add into um, any tours that we do, you know, the and actually know what you're doing. I mean, I did I, I did a yoga thing with my uh, Thailand group because my local guide there is really, really good. She's really, really into yoga much more than I am. And I thought, gosh, this is this is a really nice thing to add. And you and I did that when we traveled in Turkey. And that was so cool to have little mornings where we get up and do a bit of yoga before we started our day. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that, that kind of move, any kind of movement, right? And stretching, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's good, you know? And um, as you know, when we travel, oh my gosh, aches and pains and tight neck and, and sore back and tight. I always feel like if we sit on a bus all day, you know, you feel tight on the sides of your body, almost like your ribs and your hip bones are crunching into each other. So any kind of like side stretch, you know, lots of, lots of little movements that um, just people don't even think that a few minutes would make a difference, but it does, you know, it really does. Yeah. And it takes so little to actually um, see a benefit. So while we're on this topic, I just want to let everybody know who's watching, who is a Patreon supporter. Well, and actually everybody on Friday, Chris is going to join us and she's going to do a little wellness seminar where she's going to talk. We're going to talk about travel health because uh, we are going to travel again. So let's just be prepared. We're going to get our uh, stable of skills put together while we're uh, kind of in our homes. Uh, so what we're gonna do is talk about travel wellness and then come with uh, sweats on because we're going to do some movement as a group together. And Patreon supporters can actually get the Zoom code if you would like to be on and talk to Chris. And uh, if you would like to kind of join in, we're gonna do a little bit of easygoing yoga, but I mean, not yoga in the way that you're gonna be you know, sweating afterwards, but just ways to learn how to take care of your body um, while you're traveling, so. Okay. Yeah. And that's yeah. going to be really fun. Yeah. So, and that's the thing that I think is important. And what I'm excited about what we're doing on Friday is I think a lot of people think that yoga is this thing for like suburban moms who drive like an Escalade, you know, it's like that's <laughs> yoga is something for everybody. It's for young people. It's for older people. It's for everybody because it's just something that's so good for you to take the time to figure out how check, just check in with your own body. Like who does that? You don't do that normally. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, in the yoga, as you know, I mean, there's so many different styles and I, I can't even tell you how many times on tour when people would find out that I was a yoga instructor would ask me, you know, Oh, you know, my doctor, I'd hear this every, every tour. Oh, my doctor tells me I should do yoga. You know, I'm prescribed to do yoga. And, um, but they, I think a lot of people get a little, it, it's daunting, right? I think it's changing. I think there's a lot more information out there now because it's become much more mainstream, but I think even it still exists out there, this idea that you have to have the certain yoga body and wear the certain yoga outfit and um, you have to be, you know, skinny mini and, and um, be able to put your foot behind your ear or whatever. And, and that's not it. I mean, it's, if you can do that and you want to do that and your body says it's okay to do it, great. But um, yoga means so many different things, different styles. And often I tell people, you know, check it out. And if you, and if you go somewhere and you don't like it right away, it might be the teacher and it might be the style, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like anything, um, you need to yeah. find the right, the right niche. Yeah. When I started in yoga, it was, gosh, it was like a long time ago. I think it was before my first son was born. So it was more than 16 years ago. And the studio that I went to was this really old fashioned studio where the guy was like really into a very specific style and they were serious. Like uh, I used to go with a friend and we used to call the guy the yoga dongle. <laughs> Cause he would, <laughs> cause he would come around and yell at you. Like if you weren't in the right position exactly, he'd come around and he'd just get pissed. And it was so like, you must do things the right way. And you know, I went because I felt like it was good and it was actually kind of athletic and it was, I'm, you know, I'm not actually a good athlete in general, but I'm very flexible. So I thought this fits my body well. And I did yoga there for a number of years, but then it's only been in the last year or two that I have found a studio where I really like the community and yeah. I really like the style. So it takes time. Sometimes you got to kind of keep at it until you find the right community, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, and that sounds like it's probably Iyengar. Iyengar, he, oh my gosh, he lived until his, into his nineties. And I think he passed away. I don't know, within the last five years or maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and he is, I would call him, you know, 
the godfather of alignment. And so like everybody, every yoga instruction class or, or training class, I should say, always has his information on alignment. And like, you could go to a class like you're talking about and like, just be in mountain, just standing there and be there for five minutes while they go through every little, you know, point on your body and make sure you're totally in this perfect alignment. Um, but his, his information, his instruction is like the touchstone, you know, it's like from there, other styles, you know, emanated basically, but yeah. And I've heard, I've heard of classes, he, his, his classes and his, his, you know, students of his, um, lineage, I guess, doing the same thing, being very like <laughs> militaristic. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad I started that way because now I am always in really good alignment. And I think about all the different steps that were like pounded into me from the beginning. Like you yeah. need to do this way, like triangle, you have to set up a certain way. And if you don't do it that way, it's wrong, you know? And at the time I just thought this was what yoga was. <laughs> it's good to start that way, but yeah, I'm, I, it's nice to find a community where they're a lot more about like, what, what is your body feel, feeling like? What do you need to do today to help your body, right? Well, and, and also, you know, when yoga really came, became um, very, the athletic style, it was, it was basically formulated for young Indian boys going into the army. So it was like calisthenics. So oh. that's, some of it was like, it's so like dynamic and fast. I'm talking about Ashtanga, which is a very, yeah, it's a very physical athletic style. And yeah, that's what it was formulated for you know, these real gumby young body boys that could, you know, had the, the stamina and the strength to do all these crazy moves and fast. Um, and, and that's not for everybody's body. And, and, and that's why, you know, you see some of these postures and it's like, should I, do I really want to do that? You know, I can't even tell you some of the postures it's like, um, no, <laughs> no, yeah. I don't think I want to go there and that's okay. Yeah, I did Ashtanga a couple of times when I was in London and um, that, that I really enjoyed it because it's a challenge, but oh my God, like that's a, that is a challenge. Like that, that was hard. And that's why Madonna has such a rocking body too, at whatever yeah. she's 75, she's because she, she does Ashtanga. Yeah. But that actually leads me to an interesting point. Um, I know that you travel when you, and you do yoga for yourself while you're traveling. Um, one of the things I tried last year and the year before was actually finding yoga studios in places that I was. So like London, I was in London a lot for doing the family tours last year. And so I just joined a yoga studio and I was going in the mornings. Have you done that? Have you tried going to studios? In yeah. Yeah. And, and some of your comments made me think of some of my experiences. So um, there's, there's one studio in Paris that I really like. I mean, there's, Quite a few but one i found that i really liked um and i found it because one of the one of the yoga instructors i call her the, the yoga rock star um elena um brower and she had an event in paris in connection with this studio called rasa rasa paris or is it rasa yoga rasa yoga and um they had this event where they all were wearing white and i think they were all on the champ de mars in front of the eiffel tower practicing practicing yoga anyway so i thought well if she likes this studio, be worth it and um and it is it's it's a good studio um they have both instructors in french and english and then when i led um my first private tour that was a yoga it was like a rick steve's tour mixed with with yoga tossed in for, for extra spice um we went to that studio in paris and that was kind of our um, beginning of the tour which was great um and so that was a good one and ashtanga i did an ashtanga class and it just made me laugh because I, I broke my arm when I was a kid. I fell off a horse, um, so I was showing off. It's my own fault. But so my, my elbow is really very bizarre. Like if I straighten it out, it has a crazy bend to it. And um, I know that an instructor is a good instructor if they mention my arm. Like if they try and fix my arm, you know, <laughs> like they come uh -oh. over. And I'm like, okay, they're good because they are looking at my body. They're seeing like, how, how am I moving, right? Yeah. And so this Ashtanga class, there was probably a dozen people in the class, you know, and uh, the class was maybe halfway through. And all of a sudden he, the instructor looks at me and he goes, what's wrong with your arm? You know, <laughs> just like, what's wrong with you in front of everybody? And I was just like, in French, I'm like, uh, it was, I broke it as a kid and, you know, it works, you know, whatever. But it was just so funny because you would not have that happen in the States. I mean, you would have an instructor that would talk, have a personal conversation with you like, Hey, you know, what's going on? Is, you know, is your arm okay or whatever, but. Wouldn't be called out. Yeah. Be called out. Like what's wrong with your body. 
just made me laugh. Yeah, um, that, that sounds consistent with my experiences in France. <laughs> yeah. And then it's there was this other one. So for a while I was big into hot yoga. Oh, really? Okay. And Bikram is one of these styles that um, there's been a few of these yoga rock stars that have fallen from grace because of sexual impropriety or financial or both. And um, Bikram is one of these guys. He basically has been chased out of the country. Um, but Bikram started this whole, yeah, <laughs> he started this whole hot yoga craze. Um, and then there's been other, you know, people that have taken it and made it their own in hot yoga. But he, um, all of his studios, it's the same dialogue and the same postures. It's 26 postures. You repeat them all. It's 90 minutes long. It's like a hundred and it's like a thousand degrees. I don't know, 105 or something. It's super humid. Um, and so anywhere you go in the world, if there are still our Bikram studios around, there's less of them, but anyway, um, it will be the exact same dialogue, the exact same postures. There might be a little bit of, you know, flourish here and there from the instructor, but and so this woman that I went to in Paris, it's right by the Beaubourg, you know, the um, George Pompidou Center, the real crazy modern museum. And um, I went and, oh my gosh, I, this woman was just on me because there's this really weird breathing technique that you do. It's like, you go like this. And then when you inhale, you bring your elbows up and your elbows are supposed to be really close together. And we think, oh, sorry, when your chin is down, your elbows are up and then you go like this and then you're, their head is back. And I always have a really hard time with that. Like they want you to have, I don't know how people do it, but some people keep get their elbows really high and <laughs> I'm not very coordinated. It might sound funny. I'm a yoga instructor, but I'm, when people say that I look graceful, I always laugh. Cause I'm like, I am so not coordinated. Anyway, this woman was like on me, like I was not doing it right in her eyes. Like I, you know, my, my cadence or I don't, I don't know but she was just on me. And when I left, I had knots in my upper shoulders. I'm like, I don't think I'm supposed to have that effect after a class. <laughs> I really don't think that's the point. Yeah, that's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing was, I was like, okay, well, that was a one-off. This woman was just on my, on my butt. And I was, I'm like, okay, whatever. A year later, I was, I went to the same studio and I had remembered that experience. So I'm like, oh, what are the chances I'll get her again? I got her again. And I was like, oh, my God. and so I, I wanted to just like run. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to have this experience again. But it was one of these like mental challenges, I guess. I was like, okay, I just need to breathe through this and just, you know, whatever. And she was the same, just super militant and, you know. Anyway, it was, it was a challenge, let's just say. It's unfortunate when people do that, because I think it kind of chases people away from yoga. And I really firmly believe that it is something that is, everybody can do, and it's therapeutic for everybody. I mean, no matter what you do, it's just, it gets people moving. And I think so many times people are intimidated by fitness in general, because it seems like only fit people can, can be into fitness. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, it's one of the few things I feel like everybody can, can access in one way or another. So, but yeah. just to change topic just a little bit, um, I realized as you were talking and we're talking about Paris, you know, I've seen you in Paris. We, you know, I know, I know that you work in France, but actually I've known you more than 20 years and I have no idea how you ended up in France. Tell me, I, I have know. never asked you that. How did you end up being a France expert? I have no idea. Uh, well, you know, one of those things like, you know, how we just kind of take steps and we keep following in that, that path. Um, studied French in high school. Um, I actually started really late. Um, most of my friends started in like junior high. I didn't start until um, 11th grade actually because um, I was in band. I was a band geek for a while and I loved our band. We had this amazing marching band and we went all over the place we went to you were in a marching band oh, yeah awesome. and I played, played French horn of course I of course you played French horn wow I didn't know that but no it was we, we had it was it was like a huge school pride thing we had like this super sexy um what's the guy in front with the great costume uh, okay. the 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 Oh, it's escaping me. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. What the, is the major, the major, the band major, something like that. I think so. Yeah, he was super sexy. Oh my gosh. And so like, um, he was, and he was like really dynamic. So like, you know, he had this great costume and a nice little butt. And anyway, so he was, he was our mascot, our leader. And um, we went to Winnipeg. We went to, we played in the um, Green Bay Packers halftime show. 
we um we went to um oh in the cotton bowl down in texas we took a bus down to the cotton bowl in january and we played um in the cotton bowl again halftime show um so i mean our our band director was amazing like he just made it all happen and so after 10th grade he told us he was like the end of tenth, my 10th grade year he's like um we ran out of money we can't you know we're not traveling for two years and that was like for me that was like i was hooked on travel at that point i'm like I can't travel what oh that's interesting so that's how you got into travel was doing all these trips for band that's cool well, yeah i mean i i think i always liked liked traveling but um in fact my first big trip with my family was to seattle oh okay and oregon yeah and so that was that really hooked me on travel i think but anyway so finally i, I was like oh forget that if i can't travel i'm gonna i'm gonna get out of band so i quit band and french was there was only French or Spanish as the options. And so, and actually my background is more German. I probably would have taken German had there been that option, but I'm glad I took French. Um, and then, you know, studied French, studied, um, and when in college, I um, lived with a host family twice in the South of France. Um, and so my first job out of, out of college was with a student exchange company. Hey, kitty, kitty, it's a beautiful kitty. Oh my gosh. She's, I tried to keep her away from jumping on me during a, a coffee chat, but she's making so much noise that we just let her out. <laughs> oh, beautiful. What is she? Is she a Maine Coon? She no? is a, a tortie. She's like a, long, a tortoise shell. So. Oh, sure. I have, okay. I have one of those, but more, more light colors. Beautiful. Yeah. But anyway, so, I mean, I um, studied abroad, lived with a host family. Um, first job out of college was a student exchange company that was purchased by a French travel company. And what they had always done was just basically homestays completely. And um, it was called Nacelle, a very, very well known and, and very um, res respected company. And they were bought by um, a company called CLC that was based down in Rodez in the south of France. And so they were all about tourism, you know, uh, tours for students and teachers. And so they wanted someone like me who spoke French because I would be working with the parent company in France. Um, and had travel experience in Europe, which of course in college, I did the, the typical, you know, get the backpack and the you real pass and went all over the place. Um, and so they hired me for my, my, those skills and just got into travel and more on the like tour operations and customer service and such piece, jumped a couple jobs and then, um, you know, on a whim moved to Seattle and was like, oh, if I could work for Rick Steves, that'd be so great. And so got a job, you know, met, met Rich Sorensen. And I think he liked me because I had the Midwestern accent, you know, he's from Wisconsin, so. <laughs> and you started in what, 99 or 98? 98. 98, okay, and I started yeah. in 2000, yeah, yeah. That was when Rick was still trying to force through like three week tours for everybody. Yes, I remember that, yep. I started in those days, yeah, we used to do 20, 21 days. Yes. Every 21 days, no matter what it was, 21 days. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. That was, uh, wow. That was a big, that's a big trip. It's a big commitment, especially to the group too. It's a commitment to being with, uh, the same 25, 28 people for three weeks. <laughs> oh, I think about it now. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I do that? Yeah. I, you know, there, I think that I always liked, I liked it, but I always felt that there were day, I called it day 16 blues because it was day 16 that everybody was ready to kill each other we <laughs> together for too long. And so I had an agreement with the hotel in Sorrento that uh, because by the time we got there, that was day 16 and everybody was really on, getting on each other's nerves. And for me, it's like trying to be the mom and keep everybody cool was hard. And so I had an agreement with the hotel um, guy there that he'd have a gin and tonic on the desk for me as soon as I walked into the Oh yeah, the day 16 blues. And actually for formulating my own tours, that has been a lesson that I learned. It's like, don't ever go beyond day 16. You know, day, you gotta have them all, all your tours have to be less than 16 days because day 15 and 16, you get over the hump and then you're okay after that. But yeah, those are two hard days. So. I can see that. Yeah, and I, but I think nowadays too, like, you know, back when we started, I don't know if there were as many people doing their own travel before or after the tour. I mean, I think they did maybe depending, but it feels like now it's like, you know, people are always kind of like extending or, you know, on either end. And um, I don't know that it's not absolutely necessary for us to run as long of a tour anyway. 
Well, and that's to, uh, exactly what I was just thinking is that um, I think that travel has become so much more accessible just also in terms of people being able to do stuff themselves. Like when we started as tour guides, taking a tour was kind of, I mean, I wouldn't have thought to do it because I was a backpacker and, you know, backpackers can sleep, you know, under stairs or in a bus station and it's fine. But for somebody who is older or has a family or whatever, back, you know, 20 years ago, it was not that easy. I mean, to make hotel reservations, you had fax and whether or not they got back to you was always a mystery. And it was just a lot more tricky. And now it's so incredibly easy. So yeah, it is. It's amazing. I mean, how did we, how do we survive without cell phones? My God, you know, like when we first started guiding, right. And we just had like the phone cards and you would try and make sure everything was lined up in advance. And sometimes you'd show up and just be like, Oh yeah. There were many days that I just was not a hundred percent sure that like the hotel would even be what we thought it was going to be. And I, I remember walking around with big bags full of the Jatoni for the, um, the coins, uh, in Italy or the coins for the, the, the phones in Italy. Cause oh there were even phone cards. When I started, you had to oh. have the Jatoni so you had to plonk the coin. Wow. It was like a special coin with a slot in it. So okay. I had my phone cards and then I had my, my Jatoni. Yeah. It was, it was the wild West man. When we started guiding, it was the wild West. <laughs> totally I know I mean I think about it now I'm like how did I not be more stressed I mean I don't know I think you just kind of lived with a certain amount of uncertainty and just ass assuming in some ways maybe we were a little bit more relaxed in the sense that there was always that chance that something might not work out and you just have to be prepared for that whereas now it's like you can check up on most everything and if it doesn't work out there's a little bit more like drama I think I, don't know. I think that that's absolutely true. And I've, I've observed that in the last few years, as I see like people who are younger getting into this business that um, they, a lot, everything is set up, everything's set up for them. They have a program to follow, you know, and it doesn't matter what tour company you work for. It's kind of the same. They kind of set it up for you. You can double check on things. You have email confirmations, all this kind of stuff. But when you and I started, it was seriously like, good luck. Here's a pile of money, have fun. And you're just like, I'm 25 <laughs> and you're giving me $10,000 and you're entrusting me with 28 people and a giant coach. <laughs> like, are you kidding? <laughs> I know. I, know. I, I keep remembering, like, I'd always go to this certain place by the like, stock exchange in Paris to cash my check. Right. And yeah, I had this huge money belt with like, what a cash. I'd be like, oh my God, I'm going to get rolled and I'm going to be so screwed because yeah, I remember once they I was sent out with like thirty thousand dollars in checks because I had to distribute them to people who were already in Europe, and because that's how it worked back then. And it was just yeah. like I just remember being terrified getting on the plane with my money belt, and I just kept like walking around like this. <laughs> oh, don't touch me. <laughs> But yeah, it's, I think that that was such an incredible blessing, actually, because um, we started in a time when it was so rough and tumble, that now nothing bothers me, like literally nothing bothers me, like, and, and we also had to do all of our own tours too, you know, we had to do the, you know, all the museums, we had to do all the city walks, we had to learn absolutely everything. And now there's local guides that you have just about everywhere, but gosh, that was so great because now we have all that, that crazy skill set, you know? Well, and I think too, like, don't you feel like you're more flexible as far as like um, uh, hunting a little bit? Like you, you're like, oh, well, you know, I've never been to this spot, but for lunch, this might be a good spot. And I'm not afraid to do that. You know, it's like, okay, it, it might be great. It might be mediocre. It might be horrible, but we'll try it. You know, I, I'm not so worried. Whereas I think, um, yeah, I, I just think we're, we're, we're used to some stuff going wrong. <laughs> well, and you, you, I think you learn in that situation that it's going to be okay, you know, and, and I think that's just a philosophy I take with me in my life that no matter what gets thrown your way, whatever curveballs get thrown at you, you're going to figure out a way to make it work. And I think that is the best skill that I've taken away from, from that, from my, my career is that, yeah, I mean, right now the world is turned upside down, but I'm okay and you're okay, like we're figuring it out because that's the skill that we learned in our profession, you know? Well, and sometimes some of these mistakes or, or, or mishaps can turn out to be really fantastic, you know, right? I mean, sometimes the, the, the lemons become lemonade because you all of a sudden ran into this, you know, local guy who was making his own wine in his, in his garage and it's like, whatever, and he gives you a shot of it or something. I don't know. 
just, you know, fun experiences can happen. But I think that isn't that just like a point of view, though, that you use for your entire life? I mean, I really do. You, you know, even like the whole COVID thing, like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? I don't have a job. I don't know how I'm going to get through it. OK, well, let's put our tour guiding skills on the table here. OK, so what can I do? What are the things I can do? What are the things I can change? You know, and that's, I think, always the way that I I think my my mentality and the way I approach things has really been shaped by all of my years. Oh, well, I believe I believe it. I mean, when I was like you, I'm like, okay, what do I do with myself? I can't work. And, and and at one point I was, you know, on like simply or simply hired or whatever. And I was Googling for, I'm like, well, I could do anything really. But I'm like, do I really want to do anything? No. And so my search word was wine. I like wine. And, and so I came up with wine and that's, that's a, a, as you know, in tandem with teaching yoga online, I've learned, well, I'm a wine rep now. So I'm selling wine. Um, learning a lot about wine. And I told you the other day, just I was, how amazed I was that um, how many grapes, how many grape varieties in Italy. And I feel really kind of, you know, sheepish. The fact that I, you know, for me, the French wines are the best, right? And so I thought, oh, you know, I've had good wine from Italy. It's fine, you know, but oh my gosh, I'm like blown away about how much, how much different wine there is and the variety. And um, I had a Fiano for the first time. Oh, I don't know if you've had a Fiano before. I have, yeah. Oh, so good. And um, anyway, and, oh, I want to show you my favorite tool. Oh, um, yeah. I don't think I will ever not be without this. So this is called a Coravin. Uh -huh. And um, people who know wine or work in the wine industry will know what this is. But it's, it's basically a way for me to um, take a bottle of wine and be able to give samples um, to many different people. And it, the, it could keep the wine the bottle of wine good for months and months, uh, maybe even a year or so. Um, Cause what it's all about is it's, it's got this, um, this needle, it's like a, a medical grade needle. And then in the handle, there's a canister of argon gas. Um, and so the end of the needle has holes on the sides so that when it pierces the cork, um, you press this little, this little lever and you can hear the gas, right? And then the argon goes into the bottle. So it keeps air out, allows you to pour a little wine and then it keeps the, the bottle good. So this bottle I've probably had in my wine fridge now, um, oh gosh, probably three months. Um, and this is from the Veneto area in Italy. And it's got, it's a Cabernet, Merlot, Carmenere blend. But anyway, so what you do is you just put this on the bottle. I seriously like will always have this tool. I just think it's the coolest thing. <laughs> uh, it's like uh, okay, so then yeah, like something for me because I I take a bottle of wine and I'll drink it over. <laughs> I'll have like a little glass of wine every night, but I I'm I hate to open a nice bottle of wine because it's just me. You know, I live with teenagers, so <laughs> I'm not going to feed them the wine. So yeah, I mean, this is sounds perfect for somebody who only drinks a little bit at a time. It's awesome. Yeah, I'm the same way as you. I mean, I I've got also the you know the plat the rubber plugs that you pump. You know, take the air out, and yeah. that works for a while, but it might only last for three to five days. You know, keep it good. Whereas this, it could last forever. So then you just this is an old school one. So you just press it down so it pierces the cork. And I think my my needle might be getting a little a little old because it shouldn't go down that difficult, more difficult. So then here I'm just gonna show you. I'm just gonna shift my thing. Mm -hmm. And then so I just press that little lever. Yeah. And it puts gas in. So it doesn't come out fast. So if you're pouring yourself a glass, you have to be kind of patient. That's great. Um, That's great. <clears throat> Yeah. But yeah, so then, and then you've got your little, you know, little glass of wine. <laughs> it's, it's afternoon here, so I can have a little sip. Okay, yeah. Well, it's almost 11 here, so I mean, <laughs> it's, it's also, you know, COVID time, so who knows what time of day it is. <laughs> Up is down. <laughs> 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 who really cares? <laughs> so so I've, yeah, so I've loved this. I mean, learning uh, well it's like anything that you start to learn you realize how much you don't know because i felt like oh i know yeah i've been to how many wine tastings how many wineries over the years right and i know a lot about the basics of wine making and um the different regions in france and what what how the differences are but um 
there's just so much more to learn, you know, and there's new styles coming out. Have you ever had orange wine? That's kind of- I nice. have actually. Um, Andrew, my business partner, he and I uh, in Slovenia go to a, a region that's really well known for orange wine. So we do an orange wine tasting. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. I have not had one yet, but I, I plan to soon. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, just just learning. I'm, I'm hoping to do a, a wine education class next month. Oh, um, yeah, there's, there's all these different, you know, education tracks you could take, like there's a sommelier track, which I, I'm not interested in. There's another one called um, WSET, um, which I think one of our, our um, colleagues in Spain has done. Um, and I can't, his name is escaping me right now. But anyway, I've heard of it before. And it's for people who are doing what I do, um, wine repping or working in restaurants, creating wine lists for restaurants and stuff. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm hoping to do that training. It might be an online one, but, um, and I was going to say about that. Oh yeah. And so, um, interestingly enough, one of my old, um, past yoga students makes her own wine. She gets together with her girlfriends and they make wine in their garage. Oh, fine. And, you know, I think they get wines from like Cal your grapes from California and I, I'm not sure how they do it, but they, they make their own wine. She actually gave me a bottle of Nebbiolo um, that she made. I haven't tasted it yet, but um, I'm going to do a um, wine and food pairing party with her and her girlfriends. Just There's just seven of them. Um, and we're going to do that at the end of the month. And I, I think it could be something that I could I could do a few more times out there. We'll see. But I'm excited. You know, small group. We'll keep it COVID friendly and they're making the food and, you know, they've already been gathering, obviously, um, trying to keep it safe and all that. But definitely the funnest part for me is, is the tasting, you know, and, and, and getting people to try wines and at, at restaurants or wine shops. Uh, wine shops have been the biggest thing I've been focusing on, of course, because restaurants are so, it's pretty, pretty dangerous, dangerous out there for them. Yeah. Well, and I think that uh, the individual homeowner, the individual human probably is drinking more wine than they maybe were a year ago. <laughs> I would say I'm probably drinking more wine than I was a year ago because <laughs> we're stuck in the house a lot. So, but that's, you know, I think it's interesting how we're all kind of being challenged to reinvent ourselves, you know, and, and think about what we have so many skills as guides that it's interesting to kind of take them and like doing this. I didn't know that I liked interviewing people. I think it's super cool. And I, you know, I, yeah, I know that I know a lot of interesting people, but it's never occurred to me to actually like interview them and talk to them, you know, in front of an audience. So it's, you never know where this path is going to take you. And at the end of all this, who knows where we're all going to be and what we're going to be doing, but maybe it'll be something more interesting. I think that all, the creativity is, is pretty cool. So, I mean, you've got so many interesting things going on and then you started a website, right? Yeah. So now it was funny because early on, I was like, oh my gosh, how do I juggle all this? Because I had a few things going on. And so I, um, I've always had the yoga studio website. So the, the studio was called Yoga Forest and I'm, I'm in the process. I'm probably going to, um, you know, file a DBA and call it virtual forest because that's what I call my online presence, virtual forest. Um, <clears throat> and, and then for my travel stuff, which will include um, yoga retreats as well as like wine tours for next year. Uh, it's called chocolate suitcase because travel is delicious. So um, yeah, so anyway, so I've got both of those going and they both kind of, you know, point at each other at some point, you know, as far as um, if you're interested in travel or yoga retreat, go to the chocolate suitcase and then chocolate, su ch chocolate suitcase, of course, talks about if you're interested in yoga, go to the, the other one, so. So then that leads me to a question of like, you know, let's say, let's put ourselves in the future and let's say a year from now, this situation is, you know, winding down and travel is probably going to be possible again. What are you going to be doing? What do you think you're going to be doing after this is all over? I want to be in Europe, damn it. <laughs> uh, well, the plan is next fall, a year from now, I should be there. Um, I have a wine tour planned for October. Uh, with a, a mutual friend of ours, Tony. Um, I have a yoga retreat right now. The, the dates are um, up in the air, but um, we were looking at June, but I'm not quite certain. We want to wait to see, you know, when is travel possible? Um, and that's with um, our friend, Berlinka. Berlinka has a, um, a place, a beautiful place in the south of France. So the plan is to go stay with her. And so that may be shifted into, into the fall. 
Um, but so I'm looking at both yoga retreats and wine tours in September, October next year. That sounds so fun though. I mean, that sounds like actually, as I'm always the optimist and I'm thinking, would you have pushed yourself to do that? Yeah, you wouldn't have. No, no. And yeah, so I, I really, I'm actually very excited about the future, I have to say. I, I think, um, like you say, we've been pushed to do things that we wouldn't have otherwise. I wouldn't have pushed myself to learn how to use technology like this and do video discussions like you. I've been doing interviews with people I miss. You know, I've done um, uh, for the wine company, Lumpian Wines, that I'm, I'm repping for. We just did last week an interview with an a Alsatian winemaker, Michel Fonet. Um, and that was a lot of fun. You know, we broadcast from a wine shop. Um, and then what's also fun with the interviews, I've, I've done um, a tour guide friend, I've done a, um, another friend who's more of a chef, uh, another winemaker that um, we visit on our tours. And what's been fun is um, my import company that I'm working for, we're likely gonna start importing wines from my friends in France. One is in the Côte du Rhône, um, the Domaine de Monchon. It's very likely that, that I'm fingers crossed, we're tasting all their wines. And then another one is um, a winery in the Loire Valley that we that we visit. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I think it, it would be just so much more fun for me to be selling my friend's wine, you know? Yeah, well, and that's, it's neat to kind of look at your resources and go, oh, actually there's, I do have something here. You know, it's not like everything's been taken away. It's like, oh, actually I have something here and I can build something even better, you know, in the future, so. Yeah, or in just different, you know? And I think too, like, you know, these virtual tours that people are doing, right? I mean, <clears throat> even in the off season, um, you know, boy, that, I, I, why not continue that? Because um, there will always be people wanting to uh, travel vicariously. And in the winter months when maybe it's just, maybe not, not the best time or, you know, depending where you wanna go like Europe, um, why not have a virtual tour that maybe encourages you to to um, walk every day, like a virtual pilgrimage that we're going to talk about it um, in the future. So, you know, yeah. just so much out there. Yeah, well, and I think that that's why, I mean, I feel like I'm kind of like the, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of trying and doing all of these things that sometimes are a fail and sometimes they're not. And I don't mind messing up. I don't mind like the you know, we trip over the technical details and, you know, my poor friend Hoda on Friday kind of got in trouble with some of the, uh, with some of the red tape at, in, in Egypt. And it's like all these little things that feel like at the time, I'm like, oh man, I wish that had gone perfectly. It doesn't actually matter because the idea is we're figuring this out and it's a cool thing to be figuring out. And what is it that people respond to? Like, so I, I absolutely agree that I think that the virtual travel piece of this is gonna stay with us. I think it's something that we're gonna learn and then it enables people who can't travel any longer or maybe it was yeah. never accessible them, to them to, in the first place that they can at least have that sensation that we have when we travel, right? Oh, totally, totally. And, it, and even just think about how it can embellish a future tour, right? Yeah. Especially if it's a path that you might travel often, you know, as, as far as letting people know and getting people a glimpse as to like, what are you going to see? What are you going to experience? Right. I think that's really exciting. Yeah. It gets people excited about new ideas and travel. So, you know, it's, yeah. uh, I think it's possible to keep the dialogue about travel going, even though maybe we can't go, you know? So I have a, I have a funny question yes. for you yes. to kind of wrap up a, a real quick little discussion that I, I wanted to wrap up on the internet right now, the big thing that the big hoo-ha, at least on my internet, my Twitter feed and such is how much people love or hate the show, Emily in Paris. Oh, yes. I just finished it. I finished it yesterday and I'm really divided. I'm just not entirely sure how I feel about it. And you said that you'd watched an episode. So what are your feelings on that show? I watched just the first one. And it's funny because my friend in Paris that I, I had an interview with, Heather um, Stimler, she has a really great um, site that she writes on, but um, she encouraged me to watch it because she had heard so much about it. So when I first started watching it, my 15 year old was in the room and she's like, Ugh, bad acting. <laughs> that's, like, that's the first thing that my daughter said. But, but she watches these creepy vampire shows, which I'm like, you think the acting is good in that? I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, 
and and she hit on that first show as you probably remember i mean so many stereotypes that the french are mean that the you know the first floor is is one floor up you know on the ground floor isn't it the same in italy there's a name for the yeah. ground floor yeah. yeah 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 um you know some of these just really common stere you know stereotypes and just cultural things that um we actually will often mention on tour because people don't 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 realize you know um but so yeah it, it was it was cute i have to say i thought it was cute and i'm i'm going to watch more i just i think it's funny but the the plan with my friend heather is i'm gonna because she can't watch it in paris yet it's not you know netflix hasn't allowed the parisians or the french to watch it yet I, I would be if i were netflix i would never let the french watch it <laughs> really really oh yeah but we were planning to like um discuss you know like I'll, i'm like oh I'll, I'll tell you what i see and, and we can talk about it but before before she already knew the premise of it and just that it's this you know young plus the woman who's supposed to be having this big time job she looks like she's 12. i'm like yes really? <laughs> i'm like really I don't well, I, yeah the, the whole premise and she's like having these romances with these guys who are clearly like in their 40s and 50s and you're just kind of going I don't even think you're legal to drink. <laughs> I know. I know. That's what I thought too. But anyway, but yeah, I think um, but Heather, my friend in Paris, was telling me about it. And she's she's like, you know, I get the impression that it's based on this real, you know, very high elevated lifestyle, which it is. I mean, she's always got the fabulous clothes and the fabulous shoes and the bag and you know, all that. And and it, and she was saying, you know, a lot of people don't think that that's real. And she goes, it's real. Like Heather knows people in these upper echelons of society. And she's been to some events and such with these people and even in their homes. And she's like, there really is that lifestyle, you know, in Paris and like anywhere, London too, and all that. Yeah. Well, and you know, I, I, the first few episodes was like, oh, this is so cringy, you know. Uh, but after watching a couple of more episodes, there were some subtle cultural differences that they were cultural things that I've learned about France that were actually true. And I went, oh, actually, that was kind of an observant thing to put into the show. And then I realized that that show, that series is made by the guy who created Sex in the City. And then I went, oh, I get it. I get it. This is Sex in the City, but it's in Paris. OK, I get it. So I mean, it is improbable that this, you know, girl who looks like she's 15 years old is wearing, you know, outfits that cost more than my mortgage, probably. <laughs> Totally. The whole thing is just kind of ridiculous. Like, and this the thing is being in social media, what makes me laugh about it is that the most banal things that she puts on social media become these big things. Like, you know, she said, she said something about like, you know, ooh, pano chocolat. And she makes some kind of clever tag about about a croissant, and then she gets like 50,000 new followers because of it. And you're just going, that's not how the internet works. <laughs> I remember that. That was the first episode. Yeah. I was like, okay, really? Yeah. Yeah, it was uh it's a, it's completely improbable, but on the other hand, I mean, escapism is kind of great right now and you know, everybody wants a, a little bit of silly fun and it's so carefree and I mean, it feels a little weirdly tone deaf right now just because there there is so much in, in our world that's not going right, but on the other hand, it is great to just like check out and just be like, oh, this show is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, she I'm very curious now. Do you remember like what some of these these things that you kind of, re, you know, these are these little cultural norms or whatever that that sprung up that you were surprised about? Do you remember what they were? Oh gosh. Um, oh, about Americans being loud. That was one thing that, uh, okay. that they talked about, which is interesting because that's something that I, I don't know that Americans realize that. And I didn't know that either when I was young and actually it was being in France. I would think I was in France at the beginning of my career. So, you know, 20 years ago and people like getting really mad at me. And I thought they were being super rude by saying that I was being loud. And then I went, oh, actually, <laughs> I just don't even notice it. But yeah, Americans are, are we're kind of loud and are uh, wrong with that. It's just, it's a cultural difference. Yeah, that's something I often will bring up on my tours and just remind people like, you know, notice, but the, it's been funny though. I was at a restaurant, um, one of these old turn of the last century, um, Bouillon they call them and beautiful, just beautiful um, de decoration. And it was all French people, no American. I was like the only American I know I was, and it was loud as hell and it was lunchtime. And I was like, 
what is going on here? <laughs> you know, so it's it, it could you know, there's times when the French can be loud too, but in general, I think we tend to really raise our voices and try to talk over each other. And then it starts to be, I mean, we actually probably are more Italian because aren't the Italians pretty, pretty loud? Well, that's the, the most hilarious thing for me is how Italians complain about how Americans are so loud when it's like, oh my gosh, you guys need a mirror. Seriously, like you guys are so much louder than we are. <laughs> so much more rambunctious. Think about any Italian group that you've passed, a tour, Italian tour group, and, and they're just like, oh, I mean, yeah. it's like a cackling birds going by. I, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I just remember being on the bus between Palermo and Catania once, and uh, the every single person on the bus was on their cell phone, and it was and it was in a bus and like cacophonous. There were so many. It was like being in a stadium, and you're on a bus, and like I put on my headphones and put on noise canceling just so that I I just oh. could have a little bit of quiet. Yeah, but I have gotten that before. Like if I take groups to a restaurant or something, they always want to put the, the Americans in the back room because we're so loud. And I'm just like, you guys, <laughs> seriously, are you kidding? <laughs> but you know, I think it's hard as a culture to kind of observe yourself and go, oh, I guess, yeah, we do do that. You know, I'm, I think it's hard to have that perspective. But I think that's also another really cool skill that we as guides have developed is this ability to step outside of our own culture and take a look back and then look at cultures that we're super familiar with and look at them in a little bit more of a, with a more critical eye in a sense. You know, I think it's, it's a neat position to be in it when is. you can have the power to be able to observe the pluses and minuses of both sides. And that's one of the, the perks for you and I, as far as um, Americans leading Americans in Europe, because we understand both sides and we can look at it and go, hey, shine the light on our culture and go, hey, you know how it is at home? And it's like this, look at this, right? And be, be able to make the juxtaposition, whereas um, not all of our, our um, European colleagues are able to do something similar. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that it is, I always think that my job is not really tour guide, it's um, cultural translator, you know, and I think it's really, especially when I'm doing tours, even outside of Europe, you know, like if I'm in Cambodia or something like that, it's, it's interesting because I have a local guide and then there's me. And it's great when you have a team to work like that, work with like that, so that you can kind of get both sides. And you can also, when there are those things, those little flubs where people just are not hearing each other, that yeah. our job is to figure out what's the disconnect. Yeah. And just a little aside, I know we're getting close to the end of our hour, but like um, I was in India um, and I was with a girlfriend the last time I went and we were at this site that was amazing. And she's from California and very much, I mean, lots of garbage in certain places in India. And in this particular place that the setting was amazing, but on the other side of the wall of this castle, garbage all over the ground, right? And so my friend Lisa was very like, you know, garbage, 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 and you know, really on this track of garbage. And so we went, to, we were on the side of the wall and we looked over and we saw all this garbage. And we said to our local guide, we're like, so, okay. So we asked about the gar garbage and, he was like, what are you talking about? And we're like, okay, well, look over the edge. Like, what do you see? And he's like, nothing. Like he didn't even see it, right? To him, yeah. it was so normal, he didn't see it. Yeah. And so it was just so interesting for us. We're like, okay, this is interesting. Um, Cause we see it's glaring for us. It's like in our face, like, ah. And for him, it was, he, he didn't know what the big deal was. Not That's that he agreed telling. with it. Yeah. And, and, and on that line of garbage, and I love India and I'm not trying to slam India in any way, but I was somewhere else um, at this elephant um, sanctuary, which was an amazing experience. And all of a sudden we heard this music and I was like, oh, is that the, is that the ice cream truck? And it was a garbage truck that was playing beautiful, like happy, like come to the garbage truck and bring your garbage. And, and they were making announcements like, come on guys, bring your garbage. It was like, what? That was a garbage truck trying to encourage people to put their garbage in it. That's kind of awesome though. I mean, I love that stuff. That's yeah. Yeah. a very different approach, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, I wanted ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's fantastic, huh? Well, you know, you just never know what you're gonna find in different cultures. So are you planning to go back to India? Oh yes, I don't know when, but definitely I, I love it. It's it's so intense. And I, I know I didn't see your whole, your whole discussion with I think Reed the other day about India, wasn't it last week or just a few days ago? 
Yeah, it was on Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you guys, I remember with your your local gal guy, you were talking about Varanasi, which is where a lot of people get become cremated. That was that's like the most intense place in the world. I mean, for me, in, as my, in my experience of travel, like, wow. Yeah, I, I would love to go back. I would love to bring people there. I think um, it needs to be probably the right people. Um, at one point, I was I was promoting a tour I was going to do, and the people I was talking to India about were all saying to me, oh, I'd never go there. It's too dirty. It's too poor. They didn't want to see any negativity. Yeah, well, and I think that is an interesting line in travel is that a lot of people want to go travel for escapism. You know, they want to go. I remember taking my kids to Hawaii and we kind of did a trip that was sort of a funny two sides of tourism sort of snapshot, which was you know, part of the trip, it was my son's birthday. So we stayed at this ridiculous resort that had a dolphin pool down below. And we, I go to, and sit at the beach or sit at the pool. And there were all the parents had their, like the kids had wristbands on so that they could be tracked by like the hotel staff. And the parents had on wristbands for alcohol, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, they were there to just like, check out. Like I saw this woman who had her Kindle and she wanted nothing to do with her kids. And I thought to myself, this is a woman that probably has some really high powered job and she's really busy all the time and she needs to just check out. Yeah. And that's totally fine. I get that. But yeah. then we did this other part of the trip where we stayed in a very local village in Hawaii, like in a not a very fancy area because we wanted to go hiking. We wanted to see volcanoes and we wanted to kind of, we wanted to hike through ba bamboo forests and things like that. And it was a completely different feeling because then you're like, oh, these are the locals and the locals, gosh, Hawaii is not at all what you think it is. It's not what it's on the postcards when you actually go into the local neighborhoods and you start talking to the local people, go to the local farmer's market. It's not at all what's on the postcards. And so I think that for me is sort of in a nutshell, the way I see um, people that might want to go to India versus people that, that would say that. Yeah. And I think too, I mean, once it, it's, it, it forces you to just be really clear about the fact that there is both there's all extremes in, in the world and in, in everywhere you are. And, and, and it's just a matter of, it, in India, it's in your face. Every extreme of smell, color, um, sound, you know, I mean, just, it's just, it's so extreme. And so by the end of the day, you're just exhausted because you're like, oh my God, the senses, you're just like, you were, it's like you were taffy. You were like pulled in all these different directions with your senses, you know, all day long and, and in a good way, just really like amazing. And it's, it's probably the most amazing place I've been to. Yeah, but just an, an assault, right? And I, yeah. I think about that, about Thailand in the sense that Thailand is a visual assault, like just the visuals of Thailand. It's so like, like kind of all, all over, everything all at once sort of thing. But I think India is probably even more so, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, so many times I, I you know, <laughs> yeah, just crazy, crazy experiences. Good, good ones though. And the people are amazing, amazing. Yeah. And I think that's that's what like any kind of travel, it's like the people, it's the connections you make and, and the things you learn from the locals. And I mean, yeah, just nothing but, but good, good things to say about the Indians. Yeah, well, and you know, I think our jobs going forward, you know, as we said, we started off our careers when it was really hard to even just travel in France because of, there just wasn't, it wasn't easy. So maybe, uh, you know, how is a tour guide relevant in the future? It's helping people to be, to find places like India more accessible, places that are yeah. a little bit scarier, you know? Yeah. Scarier in our imaginations, at least, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, well, my friend, it has been fabulous to talk to you. And as always, we always have very interesting conversations. Um, so just to kind of let people know, Chris, this is uh, Chris Coleman. Her website is Chocolate Suitcase. She does online yoga courses if you're interested in yoga. And she is going to be doing more. You're going to be doing more wine tastings and interviews, right? Through your Instagram. Yeah. Um, and you can find her at Yoga Forest as well uh, for her yoga stuff. Uh, and then the exciting thing is for everybody watching um, on Friday, streamed live here on Facebook, uh, Chris and I are going to be doing a travel wellness and uh, somewhat like an introduction to yoga sort of thing. Um, so that's going to be broadcast for everybody to watch on Friday. We're going to do that. What did we decide? 10 o'clock, same time? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
So same time, so 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time on Friday. And if you're a Patreon member, this week's Patreon extra is that you can, you've got the Zoom code already on the Patreon website and you're welcome to join us and you can ask Chris questions and uh, wear some comfy clothes because we're actually going to get down on the floor and we're going to do a few stretches to help you as that you so that you can learn how to deal better with flights and sitting on buses and you know end of the day stuff and this is for everybody right it's going to be yeah. accessible yeah. yeah very accessible absolutely excellent okay all right so we'll see you guys back here at 10 a.m on friday in the meantime uh there's going to be cucina quarantina probably all week uh it's cold and uh blustery and fall like so i'm going to be doing a lot of cooking this week so please join me each day this week for a little bit of cooking and more friends and great travel information so we'll see you again soon thanks chris thank you take care oh uh, namaste right yes namaste <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you again soon ciao Hello.